Welcome to Something More with Chris Boyd, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner and Founder of Asset Management Resources, LLC, a registered investment advisor firm. We call it Something More because we like to talk not only about those important dollar and cents issues, but also the quality of life issues that make the money matters matter. Here he is, your fulfillment facilitator, your partner in prosperity, advising clients across the country, your host, Jay Christopher Boyd. Thanks for being with us. I'm Chris Boyd, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner. I'm here with um, my co-host, Jeff Perry, both of us from Asset Management Resources. Jeff, thanks for being with me again. Always a pleasure. As I'm looking forward to this uh, interview. It's very exciting. Yeah, we've got a great There's guest. a lot to talk about. And a lot to talk about in a short time. Um, really pleased to have back with us Michael Townsend. He is the Managing Director of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs for Charles Schwab and Company. Michael, thanks so much for being here. Well, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. There's so much happening. There's always <laughs> fun things to, to pay attention to with you. I want to just mention a real quick plug for people who haven't known about it. We mentioned it when you were on the last time, but uh, Michael has a great podcast. It's something you got to listen to. It comes out, what, about every two weeks, Michael? Every other week, yep. Every other week. So um, definitely check it out. Mike, give, give it a plug. Tell everyone about your, your podcast. Yeah, it's called Washington Wise, and uh, it really looks at the intersection between what's happening in Washington and and what's going on in the markets. And, you know, I like to say it's it's it. the goal is to help people understand what's worth paying attention to here in Washington and what's worth ignoring. And there's actually a lot more in the ignore category. So it's, I was yeah. thinking, yep. <laughs> so, you, uh, I, yeah, you I can, love you can it. find that anywhere. It's one of my uh, must listen to's whenever it comes out. I really do enjoy it. it it's it's uh, plus, you know, I don't know. I'm, I imagine a lot of our listenership are uh, kind of uh, news junkies anyway. So this does really help you make sense of what's important and keep perspective about some of these things. So Michael, a um, lot happening in Washington, DC these days. Most recently, we have a new speaker finally, right? Um, maybe you can give us a little bit of insight. Uh, what what do we make of this speaker and what do we expect? Does it, does it matter, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, guys, I've, I've been in Washington 30 years and I would say October 2023 was the craziest <laughs> time I've seen in my career. Um, you know, obviously it got rid of uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, on a vote early in October. And then, you know, just an absolute circus from there. We went 22 days with no speaker. Um, the, the new speaker, Mike Johnson, who is a, a Republican congressman from Louisiana, was essentially the fourth choice. I mean, there were three previous nominees that that couldn't get to the uh, the magic 217 votes on the House floor. And uh, finally, they sort of settled on Mike Johnson. And, you know, I've been saying that his biggest characteristic or quality that that got him the job is that he hadn't made any enemies yet. He was hadn't been there long enough. Yeah, he was relatively <laughs> unknown. Yeah. You know, he's been there for seven years and, you know, hadn't led a committee, hadn't right. really been in leadership, hadn't really done a lot legislatively even. Um, so I think he just hadn't made that many enemies. And everybody was like, well, we got to get this house going again. And, you know, yeah. he, he seems fine. He, he so, um, <laughs> All right, good kind enough. of a wild situation really, really was. Um, so we'll see. He's got big tasks ahead of him. Yeah. Some pretty big uh, issues, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, my first question though is, uh, did they change the rules? Do we have to worry about this happening again? Yeah, you know, they did not change the rules. And um, I find this sort of fascinating after all this. Uh, there was a lot of talk about, well, we should make it more difficult to remove the speaker because, you know, essentially the rule is any one member of Congress can uh, put forward what's called a motion to vacate the chair, and that is to remove the speaker. And that goes automatically to a vote uh, within a, a couple of days. And they did not change the rules. So who knows? I mean, could we see this play out again, you know, a few months from now? I mean, I find that kind of hard to believe, but, um, you know, it's everything that we've seen over the last few months <laughs> so, has been in yeah. uncharted territory. So, Well, there's there does seem to be a lot of dysfunction within the uh, Republican Party, which has a very narrow majority in the House. Um, they're so fractured about, you know, various topics. Um so how that's going to play out. The the big issue that seems to be on everyone's mind right now, though, is uh, will we have a budget and, you know, we're going to are we going to be facing another government shutdown? Uh, what, what do you expect to happen there? 
Yeah, I mean, we've got about 10 days as we record this. Uh, November 17th is the uh, the new deadline. And I think there's a chance we will have a shutdown. I, my sense has been all along that uh, because the new speaker has been on a job like less than three weeks, uh, that there, there will be sort of a pass given here and that they'll probably have some sort of compromise that just funds the government for a couple of months, say to like mid-January. Um, I, I think that's still the most likely outcome, but that's not a clear path to that at all. And, uh, it's so new and there's not enough time to get it all done otherwise. Huh? Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, I do think that, that's, uh, that, that there's a good chance that we won't have a shutdown uh, in November, but I think actually a very high chance that we have a, a shutdown in January or sort of whatever mm -hmm. the next deadline uh, after that is. Um, you know, one thing for investors to keep in mind, though, uh, historically, government shutdowns have not been big market movers. Uh, in fact, the, the S&P 500 has gone up in the last five shutdowns, uh, which you can you can sort of very, interpret very that how you want, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, but uh, you know, it's historically just not been a been a big deal for uh, for the markets. Mike, hasn't it been like I don't know, like thirty years since we actually had a budget done before the start of the federal fiscal year for the a budget for the whole year? Yeah, this is super common to be in this situation, and and it's been yeah, uh, literally decades um, yeah. since you know Congress was supposed to get them all done, all the twelve appropriations bills that fund every government agency, every federal program, supposed to do that by October first, which is when right. the, the the fiscal year starts. Um, they never get them all done, and so they always have these sort of temporary you know funding mechanisms, and usually they're relatively non controversial. You know, they just punt it for a couple months so they can keep negotiating. Uh, but they've become in the last few years much more controversial, and uh, and that's when you you run into the risk of a shutdown. So that's the that's the environment we're in right now this year. Well, I mean, one of the things that um, <clears throat> Jeff and I were talking about, and we probably will talk about in another episode in more detail, is um, the growing national debt and the uh, the you know the challenges that that presents when it comes to uh, the costs of it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that for a minute? Yeah, it's become a really big issue. And, and not surprisingly, it's become a big issue because of the higher interest rates. So yeah, it's just right. costing much more to service the debt. And really, over the last you know decade or more, it's been pretty easy on Capitol Hill to say, well, you know, interest rates are super low and it's not costing us that much. And so that that sort of contributed to a lack of urgency. Now, all of a sudden, this is a much bigger issue. Uh, it was just announced that we spent in the last fiscal year uh, more than $650 billion on interest, and that's an 87% increase over just two years ago. It's projected next year to to be around a trillion dollars. So, you know, once you get to a trillion dollars, hey, you're talking some real money here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, the, the thing about this fight that I find yeah, is yeah. interesting there's a there's a huge fight going on right now about this year's spending and the, the Republican controlled House and the, the Democrat controlled Senate are sort of using different numbers. But the difference between the numbers that they're using is about one hundred and twenty or so billion dollars, which in the context of a nearly two trillion dollar deficit, thirty three trillion dollars in national debt is a, is a tiny amount. Right. We're having a big fight over something that's going to barely nibble at the corners of, of this larger issue. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how Congress ever really makes a dent in the uh, in the debt at this point. But uh, it, it's certainly a much bigger issue this year than it, than it's been in recent years. Well, um, it's it seems like it's getting more uh, political attention as well, I guess, because of this rising interest cost and uh, all that goes with that. Um, Let's talk about some other issues. One of the big uh, controversies seems to be around uh, funding of uh, um, emergency packages for um, Israel, Ukraine, um, the border. There seems to be a lot of debate around this. Uh, I, personally, I, I think it's probably important to do all these things. But um, but of course, you know, in the context of debt and deficit, I guess it does become controversial. But um, Maybe you can uh, talk about how's this likely to play out. Um, there seem it seems to be that uh, some Republicans are are inclined to hold up 
some of this uh, this this uh, aid to spending. The Ukrainian aid, anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. The, it's the Ukraine aid that has become more controversial. So, so what's happened just in the last couple of weeks? The president proposed a, a big emergency spending package, more than sixty billion for Ukraine, fourteen plus billion for Israel, uh, fourteen billion for border security. About 10 billion for humanitarian aid in Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and, and other places, and then uh, some additional money, about 7 billion for Taiwan, South Pacific, to, to sort of help, uh, you know, push back a little bit against China uh, in that region of the world. Um, th the reason that the president lumped all that together in this big package is because support for Ukraine is starting to wane a little bit on, on Capitol Hill, um, and there are a lot of Republicans who just feel like. We've spent a lot. There's no question that we have spent a lot. And there's no clear sort of end to, you know, how long that's going to go on or, or anything like that. The interesting thing, of course, is that you have obviously very strong support on Capitol Hill right now for Israel aid. Right. And so tying those together sort of puts everybody in a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a box. I, you know, I, I don't want to say that. I mean, Ukraine aid still has a majority in Congress, no question. Um, but it's it's not a slam dunk as as some of these other issues. When you throw onto that, you know, border security, obviously a very controversial issue here in the U.S. You know, you just you have a lot of hot button issues sort of all in one package. So uh, it makes I, it I think it's for people to be willing to vote, perhaps to say, all right. I'm getting what I want. Uh, maybe there's money for somebody else's priority, but it helps to give it a validity that it could get past that kind of strategy. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's the goal here, right? Is you sort of, if you kind of put something in it for everybody, then yeah. they'll kind of hold their nose on the things that they oh, don't like. It sounds like, like the, the new speaker is trying to separate all this stuff out. And um, how's I that? Think there's a lot of pressure on him to separate it from his members, right? Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on him to separate it. And again, uh, it's because of, you know, overwhelming support for for Israel aid and the and the sense that that needs to get there, you know, yesterday um, is uh, that that's a big driver of it. But, you know, interestingly, one of the first things the new speaker did was put a standalone Israel aid bill on the floor and and offset it with an equal amount of cuts to the IRS which is just the, you know, the conflation of two issues yeah. that have absolutely no relation to each other. And, you know, I think a lot of people thought that was kind of a strange tactic to take that, you know, Democrats in the Senate are never going to go for that. The president is never going to sign that. And so you put everyone in this kind of difficult position of, yeah, yes, we support Israel aid, but I'm not going to, you know, start off the IRS a, for it, uh, so. a, a little bit of hostility, right? Out of the it, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so we'll see how this all plays out. Well, um, we, we have seen this whole issue of um, tensions around the world. It creates a lot of anxiety among our investors. We hear about it routinely as a question from our, our clients and listeners. Um, Almost every conversation, this, the uh, tensions around the world comes up with clients. And, and the uh, envisioning of um, escalation mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, suddenly we're in World War III, you, you know, kind of concerns. Um, what can you tell us about, you know, some of the the perspective on on that as it relates to what's happening in D.C.? Yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest questions I get and at my client events and conferences that I speak at is, you know, sort of the broader geopolitical tensions um, and how that that impacts the markets. And I think for investors, it's it's the degree of unknown of all right. this that makes everybody uncomfortable you know does the israel situation you know engulf more middle east uh countries than you're then you're you know maybe directly impacting oil and and you know you have a, an expansion yeah. of of that um the russia ukraine situation you know there's there's no clear end game here how long will this go on how how does it end um, what does what does winning and losing even look like uh, anymore for those countries? Um, and, and then, you know, the one that I probably get more questions about uh, than any other geopolitical issue is is China and, yeah. and Taiwan in particular. And Taiwan is an interesting right. one yeah. because, you know, I, I don't think that there's a high chance of that China is going to, you know, invade Taiwan anytime soon. I certainly think that China is going to continue to, 
you know, do military exercises and fly planes over Taiwan and, you know, kind of rattle the sabers. Um, but if anything, I think the Russia-Ukraine situation probably stands for China as a little bit of a warning sign of getting bogged down in something that isolates you from the rest of the world with no sort of clear, you know, uh, uh, end game there. So uh, that said, I, I think it's also interesting that here in Washington, there's been a huge increase in activity around U.S.-China relations. Um, we've seen a number of cabinet secretaries from Secretary of State. Uh, Secretary Yellen is meeting with her counterpart uh, this week. Uh, Secretary of Commerce Raimondo uh, went to China. Um, so there's been a lot of sort of, you know, this uh, diplomacy going on. And it's just been announced that uh, President Biden will meet uh, face to face with President Xi Jinping of China next week. And um, I, I think that's that's, that's a good significant. Thing. That's a significant it, step. It really is. significant yep. step to to sort of, um, you know, ratchet down some of the tension. So, um, uh, you know, all of these different hotspots around the world. I mean, this is this is common, right? I mean, this is the, the world today. There are always hotspots. Uh, but I think it's just the degree of uncertainty in all these places that makes investors anxious. Yeah, I guess um, it was, with all that's going on in um, the Israel Hamas tensions, you know, you can envision that very readily escalating. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what maybe exacerbates the worry because you could see it going quickly to many countries uh, engaged in that conflict. Uh, perhaps Iran uh, being among them. And, and then Iran has ties to some of these other countries that we're talking about that are, yeah. So it's just, it, it's understandable, but um, I keep saying, you know, all right, but is it probable? Well, you know, I think that's, it's, there's a possibility and it's something for us to be mindful of and watch for, but it's not right now the, the probable outcome, you, you know, so let's, let's step back and hope cooler heads prevail. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I think for investors, um, there's often this kind of spinning out of, of the possibilities that gets ahead of what's actually happening. And I think, yes, there's no question there are big concerns about Iran um, getting involved and then, you know, the whole Middle East sort of, uh, you know, becoming a tinderbox. But that's not where we are yet and may never be. And, you know, from an investing standpoint, you know, I think it's always important to, to sort of be cautious and trying to project out, you know, what, what outcomes might happen. Um, we're um, getting gearing up for uh, politics uh, this, this time of year, as we, as we look ahead, uh, we're talking on uh, Wednesday morning uh, this evening, there's a Republican debate. Uh, I saw that there's a, a potential, I don't know how serious it is, but a primary challenge for the president uh, and the Democrat uh, side. Uh, give us a little preview of, uh, you know, what do we pay attention to as we think about this as investors? Um, uh, naturally, we get geared up for, you know, whether we're on the red team or the blue team or whatever side we're on, we think, oh, that's the only way that things are going to get solved in this country, you know, that kind of thing. Give us a little bit of your sense of what to think about. Yeah, you know, the presidential race is really interesting because what what I'm really struck by when I talk to to investors all over the country is uh, probably the most common question I get is, can we get someone else? Uh, <laughs> and, that, uh, and that comes uh. from both sides. Um, uh, you know, there is a, uh, you know, it certainly seems right now inevitable that we're going to have a, a Trump-Biden rematch uh, in 2024. Um and, and there's just a, a, a huge lack of enthusiasm, I think, for for that matchup um, among a lot of, of people on, on both sides of the aisle. So that's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. I, I also think we have, you know, some real unknowns here. Uh, obviously, for Trump, um, multiple legal issues that are going to play out literally during the election, mm -hmm. during the primary uh, season in particular. Um, and and then on the on the Democrat side, we have, you know, just ongoing questions, persistent questions about President Biden's age and whether he has the stamina and, and capacity for for four more years. Um, so you have these two kind of, you know, very flawed sort of candidates kind of yeah. leading the way. But, you know, on the Republican side, you know, all the polling shows that Trump is is 30, 40 points ahead nationally and in the early states like 
Iowa, New Hampshire, and, and South Carolina. Um, so, you know, he's not participating in these debates, and I, I, I don't see why he would. I mean, there's no particular advantage for him. But it, the result is it feels a little bit like the JV is uh, debating, um, you know, out there. And, um, you know, almost like they're debating for who might be the vice presidential choice uh, if, it, uh, mm. if it comes to that. So, um, you know, for me, when I look at 2024, I actually spend a ton of time thinking about the battle for the House and the Senate because... Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, that's really where the policy decisions that could affect the markets, that could affect investors, are really going to be made. And we have a really interesting scenario um, shaping up where, uh, you know, the, the Senate currently a, a two vote uh, margin for, for the Democrats. Uh, the Republicans have a great chance to flip the Senate. There are mm -hmm. actually 23 Democrat senators up for reelection and 11 Republicans the 23 Democrats include the three Democrat senators who represent red states. Uh, that's Ohio, Montana, and West Virginia. Those are very tough uh, races for uh, for Democrats. So I, I think there's a very good chance that Republicans take the take the Senate. At the same time, actually, I think there's a very good chance that Democrats flip the House. And if that happens, this has never happened in history. We've never had the House and Senate flip in opposite directions in the same election. Oh, um, yeah. But... Uh, but, you know, given the dysfunction among House Republicans, particularly that we saw play out in the in the speaker uh, situation um, and they, you know, they only have a four seat margin. So it would only take a handful of seats for uh, Democrats to to capture that. And I think they have a good chance of, of doing so. So, you know, we could end up with uh, another couple years of a split Congress, but just split in the opposite way that we have now. <laughs> we do have the uh, expiration of the uh tax cut and jobs act in the next uh, term uh That's correct right. so uh, yeah you know probably the biggest issue for um for advisors investors uh looming out there so all the uh, 2017 tax cuts expire at the end of 2025 so that's you know individual income tax rates there's corporate stuff in there um from a planning perspective probably the biggest one is the estate tax uh, yeah. which i get tons and tons of questions about and you know look we're not really going to know how that plays out until after the election um but what i what i tell investors all the time is with particular focus on the estate tax the estate tax is the least partisan tax issue in Washington. And I say that because there are lots of Democrats uh, who represent, you know, mm -hmm. states with family farms and ranches and multi-generation family owned businesses. And, and the estate tax is really important, obviously, to their constituents. So oh. I could see, mm. you know, if we end up, say, with a split Congress in, in 2025, mm. I could see the estate tax maybe being broken out from some of those other, the, the, the big package. And, you know, there's some compromise there. So lots of uh, unknowns there, but that's going to be a huge issue for Congress to deal with that. And of course, that'll be the new Congress that, that takes office in January of 25. Of course, some of these issues like the estate tax or SALT, um, where there may be support for them individually, takes revenue away from the federal government, which doesn't seem to be what's needed. Right, exactly. <laughs> and that's why, you know, I think you could see, um, you know, rather than sort of, all of those 27 tax, uh, 2017 tax cuts get extended or they all expire, you may see some sort of piecemeal uh, things where that, mm -hmm. that sort of makes the numbers work. So say, you, you know, you let the top rate go back to 39.6, uh, but you change the estate tax, you know, and they sort of balance each other out, something like that. And, you know, that, that's all pure speculation at this right. point because because we don't know what the political landscape will be. But, uh, um, but yeah, I think the, uh, the, the cost of that is going to be a bigger deal. Right. Mike, I'm just going to keep you a little bit longer, if you don't mind. Um, we, we um, you often in your in your program talk about regulatory considerations, uh, the SEC being a, a you know the focus of that often. Um, would you give us a little bit of insight as to uh, for our listeners, you know, what are some of the things to be noticing and paying attention to there? Yeah, the the regulatory environment I think goes underappreciated by uh, by investors, and particularly when you have the situation that you have now, where you have a split Congress that can't get a lot done. Actually, the regulatory agencies tend to be very aggressive uh, in that situation because they're the ones that can sort of move you know move forward policy. Um, SEC absolutely taking that to heart. They have had a crazy busy agenda 
on a whole host of issues that would affect the markets. Um, you know, very high profile controversial uh, proposal around climate risk disclosure for uh, public companies. That's a that's a big one. Uh, they've proposed a series of rules to overhaul really how trading works. Um, you know, this came out of sort of the meme stock frenzy during the the pandemic, yeah. and you know that what they're proposing is you know changes to how ordinary people trade. Uh, they're actually proposing that trades go to an auction system at the exchanges, which is a whole new um, structure, and yeah. just being more transparent about sort of what happens in that pipeline. You know, investor mm -hmm. pushes trade on the computer. It disappears and it comes back and you sort of this is what you got and what happened where was money changing hands in that pipeline and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing so you know that's one um and then there's an, a, a relatively new one that looks at conflicts of interest in the use of technology when providing advice to investors uh that is incredibly broad um really tries to go at you know sort of the use of algorithmic and predictive data um, but the the way that it's written you know it would apply to using a spreadsheet uh when talking to an investor mm -hmm. and um so you know a lot of hoops that uh, advisors would have to jump through and and that sort of thing so there are a bunch of issues at the sec that we're really concerned about that you know feel a little bit like solutions in search of a problem um, <laughs> yeah. and, it seems and like it, things are going through pretty like uh, unnoticed or Kind of rapidly in the process from what you've said on on other shows that i've heard yeah that's that's exactly right and and a lot of these you know it feels like the sec is doing almost like an academic exercise right where they're solving things on paper that don't quite work in the in the way that you know actual investors act and um so that's yeah. that's been a big concern and and you're right regulatory agencies just don't get the attention you know in okay. the press and in the media that uh, that that you know congress does so you know it's something to keep an eye on because these are things that you know sort of go through little noticed and suddenly really affect uh, how the market works so yeah. that's something we're really concerned about well thank you for all the attention you bring to these issues i have to say if you're not um listening make sure you subscribe and follow the washington wise it's a great podcast and um yeah, you can always follow us while you're in that process to uh, make sure you're following <laughs> our our podcast as well uh in any case found pretty much everywhere right michael yeah so apple spotify wherever you get your uh, podcast you can find it there thanks so much for making the time to be with us thank you oh sh sure thing chris jeff really fun always enjoy our conversations all right, that's it for now. Until next time, keep striving for something more. Thank you for listening to Something More with Chris Boyd. Call us for help, whether it's financial planning, portfolio management, insurance concerns, or those quality of life issues that make the money matters matter. Whatever's on your mind, visit us at amrfinancial.com or call us toll free at 866-771-8901 or send us your questions to radio at amrfinancial.com. You're listening to Something More with Chris Boyd, financial talk show. Asset Management Resources LLC and J. Christopher Boyd, CFP, provide investment advice on an individual basis to clients only. Proper advice depends on a complete analysis of all facts and circumstances. The information given on this program is in the nature of general financial comments and cannot be relied upon as pertaining to your specific situation. AMR LLC cannot guarantee that using the information from this show will generate profits or ensure freedom from loss. Listeners should consult their own financial advisors or conduct their own due diligence before making any financial decisions.